Okay then, welcome to the opening of our innovation stage. Um, I'm delighted to have so many of you joining for what will be, we've just heard policy strategy, now we're moving into implementation. This is the real doing bit of our work. How do we deliver these amazing examples in Surrey and the amazing examples that we've seen in COVID that the tech sector is brought to life, what personalization really means. So I'm gonna go in, we're a couple of minutes late, but I'm gonna go straight in with another sh very short video of what good looks like in the community for Pam. Because it's not just the system that you've seen there, it's our, her, her whole community, her loved ones, her neighbours. So let's just see what her neighbour has to say about technology enabled care. Sorry, this is my fault. Opening, opening. This feels very strange to me, everybody. You've got your earphones on and I'm used to speaking to you. So can we just thank, thank our, you know, um, Stuart and the team at Bayer. Fabulous new services and just your contribution to the innovation stage and the setup has given us a great opportunity to actually embrace more content on the innovation stage. So thank you very much. I better keep to the slides. That would help, wouldn't it? So you heard on the, on the main stage this morning that data, people and partnerships is how we engage a new personalization in our communities. And without the data, the data alone will never deliver what we've just heard from Pam's story without the people and the partnerships working together to deliver that. The model, you're gonna hear it day in and day out over the next 48 hours, but you're also gonna hear about this model in the coming weeks and months, because this is the model for personalization in your communities. Our speakers are gonna talk back to this about the amazing work with ADAS and how those enablers give us that drive and the catalyst for change. So now we're gonna hear from Sue. Sue, Sue's neighbor, Sue's the neighbor of Pam. It's a very short video and it just demonstrates to us all that it's not just the technology, it's not just our carers and our formal system that will make good personalized outcomes with people. It's the entire system that wraps around Pam. I'm Suzette. I've known Pam a few months. She started coming out with me a bit. You know, she's got to know some different people, so she feels more confident now. Louise? No, the, the, the video's not there. Can you I'm hear Suzette. her now? I've known Pam a, a few months. She started coming out with me a bit. You know, she's got to know some different people, so she feels more confident now yeah she wants to do say lots of different things now whereas before she sort of couldn't be bothered and I, I force her sometimes you know but she does we, we get there in the end she does do it but we do have a laugh you know which is nice you have to laugh don't you let's <laughs> keep going This feels really strange and you'll see as speakers when you come onto the main stage, you can't hear anything, so it's really strange. But you see that powerful story, Pam's getting out there in the communities. It's not really just about delivering care in the home. Now, what I would like to do is welcome our first speaker to the stage. So now we'll get his limelight, Stuart Barkley from uh, the main sponsors for today's plenary, um, innovation stage, um, Bayar. Stuart, over to you. Can you all hear me? This is strange. Can't even find what I'm talking about. Bear with me. We're going to play a very short introduction um, just to VR. This is our office in Israel. Uh, this is Rotem Geslevich, um, the EMEA. Uh, director, so if we can play that video, that would be wonderful. You should hear Unlocking it, personalized outcomes depends on data. It's the key to analyzing behavior, identifying issues, and taking the right actions at the right times. 
But gathering that data has to offer choice, ensure privacy, and respect dignity. That's why we developed the touchless technology at the core of IR Care and why we're proud to sponsor the iTech Innovation Stage. Together, we can deliver person-centered care built around dignity, privacy, and independence. So, Alison, first of all, thank you. And to TSA, thank you for letting us be the sponsor of this innovation stage, the VIR stage. Uh, it's an absolute privilege. 15 years I've been coming to TSA, and it's an absolute privilege to stand in front of you right now. You are the architects. We're looking for change. Basically, over the last six months, VIR was surveying um, our customers, our partners, listening to what is needed, listening to what the sector needs, how can we personalize outcomes, how can we deliver dignity and respect, and we got some amazing feedback. Certainly during the COVID crisis, we had the risk of infection, we had the rising costs of bringing PPE in, um, and obviously the uh, impact on isolation. And we've seen a lovely video there of Sue and how that was just easily met by not necessarily tech, but actually someone just being caring. And that's what we're all about. What you'll see from uh, the surveys, we also asked how can, uh, or what are the key objectives, the three key objectives to come back fitter and stronger from the last two years. What have we learned and how can we come back fitter and stronger? One of the key objectives there, as you can see, is that uh, person-centered care rated very, very highly. Um, and obviously what we were also looking at is um, improving fall detection, but looking at fall prevention. The fall prevention I'll go into in, in, in a much bigger, much bigger conversation. Uh, but importantly, the key element, the highest one you'll see there is staff retention. Staff retention also deliver that person-centered care as well, because people first, that's what it's all about. I need to keep looking up and I forget it's there, I do apologize. Um, so what Via Care deliver is the virtual caregiver, okay? The, 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 the important bit about the virtual caregiver is that we can put a sensor in one room and that sensor will give you the falls, it will give you the data, it will give you the analysis, because we all know data is the new doctor and it's really important, but it's how we use that data. So from the, uh, the, the I'm losing train of thought, what data, so we're looking at the data and how we, how that, what data we can use to deliver that person-centered care. And what's really important, what we can see from this is that hidden falls are really important. So there's fall detection out there, but you don't see the hidden falls, really important. But the bit that's really, really interesting for us is the imminent bed exit. That imminent bed exit, if you look at the, for example, nighttime, it's dark, people go to bed, they're much higher risk of falling. If you have something in the room, because they won't be wearing their pendant, they won't be wearing their fall detector because they get told to take it off at night because that's the technology. But what is falls? What is false management? What is fall prevention? At VIR, we look at fall prevention or falls management around four key elements. Now we're working with a lot of partners, partners like Yorbo, 2IC Care, and others in the room today to deliver on these. I don't believe there's one sensor that can deliver complete fall prevention. I think it's a group. I think is used as the architects of changing all the suppliers and changing the face of care, I believe we need to work more cohesively, do away with interoperability. And if we can do that, then we can bring detection. Yes, we can do the detection, but the hidden falls, going back to that. The evaluation, the evaluation is key to all three other dimensions and the prediction and the intervention. So really what we're saying is in the last 20 years, We've worked amazingly, amazingly. As I said, we've been here, I've been here for 15 years, but amazingly we've delivered with boxes and rooms, floor mats, bed mats, and we've done an amazing job. But how can we improve? What is the future? Well, let's go touchless. Let's go via. What is via? Via is a room, one room unit. No one needs to know it there, that it's there. It's not a camera. It's scanning the room 10 times per second. So there's no camera, no wearables, and no buttons. What it uses is 4D millimeter wave, 4D imaging. Very difficult to say, but it's really simple in its context. It fits in across all platforms that you use. It can be standalone for the single caregiver. It can go through on a simple app. It can link to partners like Ascom that have single logins in the nurse call world. 
We can link to any ward and call system and we can link to any uh, social alarm unit. We're in the process of linking directly to the alarm receiving centre. And imagine we can do that without a social alarm unit in someone's house, without a telephone line. Are we really going digital? This is just a short video of how it actually really works. You should hear it. There's a bit of music in it as well. So, oh. Hopefully. This is Viar Care, the world's most advanced touchless technology. Radio frequency sensors monitor seniors 24 seven without cameras, buttons, cords, or wearables maintaining privacy and dignity at all times. BioCare collects rich point cloud data on presence and movement. Instant fall detection enables caregivers to provide rapid response, eliminating long highs and identifying even minor hidden falls that often lead to more serious incidents. If there's a fall, BioCare gets help. The system tracks in-room activity in real time, such as when a resident is in or out of bed, indicating mobility, time at rest, and other patterns across any defined period. It counts bathroom visits. High frequency or changes in schedule could indicate an issue such as a UTI that requires medical attention. Because Viar Care works in all conditions, including pitch darkness and dense steam, caregivers can confirm room occupancy around the clock and carry out efficient evacuations if required. And it alerts on imminent bed exits for at-risk residents, enabling intervention and true fall prevention. Viocare operates over 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi, supporting wall or ceiling installation and dry contact integration. Viocare's data provides constant visibility into each resident's activity and well-being, supporting personalised care plans, improving occupancy, boosting staff utilisation and enhancing your brand's value. Viocare. Protect seniors. Respect that. So you see from that video, that's a bit salesy, isn't it? I'm really sorry about that. It is about education, though. So, Viar, okay. we're on stand 51. You might see us. We're lit up in blue. We're lit up in blue. Um, you might see us. Uh, come across. Let us help you educate you about millimeter wave 4D imaging, fall detection, and importantly, the four dimensions of fall prevention. Let's have a conversation about that. I'm actually presenting tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to be delighted to present some statistics from a survey we're doing. So we're really can you come across and do that survey uh, that would really help us out and let us share what everyone is talking about. Importantly though, let's make it easy. We do the partnership program, we do it for a reason. We're, we're working with Elmbridge, we're working with London boroughs, we're working with Sunderland, we're up and down the country working everywhere and putting a lot of installations in and looking at the statistics and coming back and reporting. We want you as the architects of change to change the face of care along with VIA. Thank you everyone, Alison, thank you to your team again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and next presentation is from Andrew Pickup of Carium, our main sponsors. Now, Andrew has just come and joined the tech sector, but brings lots of health, social care, regulation background. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you kindly, Alison, and, and great to be here, everyone. Yeah, as Alison says, I'm new to this tech sector, so go easy on me, but I'm, I'm not new to the care sector. Um, uh, so I guess on behalf of Carium, let me start with that. We're delighted to be here as headline sponsor for the, for the show, and uh, it's all about encouraging collaboration, working together, come up with, coming up with solutions. Um, we've been set quite a challenge. There's another social uh, a white paper out, and uh, it's demanding, I think, a lot from, from the sector to evolve and, uh, and bring on a new era. We've talked about this for a long time, but of course, the infrastructure is changing reasonably sharply over the next couple of years, and that infrastructure uh, will help. We, as Carium, are very keen to play our part in that, um, and indeed helping all of our customers and partners do the same. I've only got five minutes. I'm very conscious that this sector is talking about one thing in relation to Carium, and that is, what the heck is it? What are we, what are we doing? So if you don't mind, I'll just spend five minutes just doing that. And um, you know, uh, if I can ask you just to remember the three things, I'm gonna talk about 
uh, you know, who we are, what we do, and probably most importantly, where we're headed. So that's it. Um, very simply here in the UK, it's the bringing together of three businesses that were acquired over the last two or three years. Uh, these are well-respected, long-established businesses, elder care, well-being, and Centra. And so now the time is right to bring them together as one company, so we behave as one. Behind the scenes, there's obviously a lot of work to be done with that. But in terms of the challenge ahead, we believe having a large established base, we can develop uh, products and services that are efficient and effective and provide increasingly an end-to-end -end solution. We've invested heavily in our uh, a fully digital platform, so we're ready to take on that future. But I think from my standpoint, again, six months into the role, change in any organization makes interesting things happen. The most interesting thing has been the people that are with us now. And they are incredibly passionate, incredibly committed. We've also augmented the team, so there's been a reasonable amount of change at the organization. But again, consistent with that same approach, passion, commitment. So carry them our on board uh, to, to helping drive this change in, in, the, in a digital era. We feel the building blocks are in place and uh, we're, we're ready to go. Um, not to confuse things though, um, but we're also part of a, a kind of pan-European organization. Uh, we've got uh, colleagues in Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, and we sell into France, uh, Germany, and Spain. Um, uh, and so there's two things we get from that. One, it's like having a, a, a big brother that can give you tips and tricks and advice on things that they've done and do in other jurisdictions. That's really important because last I checked, when you get old, the sort of same, those basic needs are consistent across jurisdiction. The second is just the, the, the digital journey that we're going on here in the UK. Others have been through it before. And so we have some learnings that we can take from that, bring to bear in this country, and that should really help. Historically, the business has come from a world where it's been largely technology based. And so we still do have a team of uh, 30 plus R&D people across the group. Um, but, but more importantly, and I think triggered with the move to Carium and the acquisitions we've made, it's very much about services. You know, how can we bring that technology to life so it's relevant for people, so it's genuine, it makes a difference. And from my standpoint, most importantly, that it's, it's uh, you know, simple and easy to use. Moving on to just what we do. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that we cover off a range of digital technology products, the various sensors and in-home solutions and mobile solutions. Uh, we also provide then, uh, you know, a, 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 there's monitoring centers around the country that effectively triage when those alarm calls come in. So we've got that covered off. And finally, and here's where we're moving into more sort of historically reactive, but increasingly more proactive services that help ensure that people get the sort of care and assistance they need at the time they need. And so linked to our name, Carium, you think of helium and beryllium, we're keen to be a kind of essential element in this ecosystem of care. Where are we headed? This is the most important bit. A lot of the words up here, you'll see plastered across uh, a lot of the organizations. So I, I would say, uh, there's nothing there's nothing new here, but we are striving to ensure that users have you know rapid safe Secure digital journeys through our products and monitoring services uh, We are involved in the TSA special interest groups particularly around interoperability uh, And so we sit here today as as uh, an organization that's very keen to collaborate with with partners that are coming up with with clever technology solutions that can help augment and improve our services um, the preventative agenda is key, and we, we, you know, a lot of us will be talking about that over the next couple of days. Uh, I'm not sure we all have the answer yet. Uh, I happen to own a care home, and I know that it's very hard to uh, prevent falls entirely, but there's obviously a journey we can go on and the things we can do to improve. And I think for me, collectively, we need to make sure that this, we understand that this is far from easy. You know, we, we need to make sure that as a, as a company, we're not just sort of making up what we think to be the answer. It's very much about uh, collaborating with our customers to determine what they need, and it will be different locally, and then working with local partners to help fill in those gaps that you know we as an organization, although we're trying to provide an end-to-end -end solution, we'll never provide an, a fully end-to-end -end solution. So it's very much about collaborating with others to ensure that we fill those gaps again locally, and so very keen to do that. Um, 
very keen to hear about you know the various bits of smart technology out there but from my standpoint again newish into the sector we've got to be careful that we don't in in in, in looking at that that we don't outsmart our customers you know you can get too complicated and uh, sometimes stuff just has to work at its, its very basic form. So that's, that gives you a flavor for kind of where we're headed. Um, so, you know, in summary, short and sharp, but I hope, I hope now you've got a better understanding of what we as Carium are, where we've come from and where we're headed. Um, we're, 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 we're very keen that, uh, you know, to play our part with technology. I, I'm a big believer that it will play a far more prominent role in the world of social care. It's the first thing that people, uh, pe people should have in their home when they start to have worries about uh, you know, needing further help. And so our job is to make sure that we keep them in that home for as long as possible. Despite my owning a care home, I still completely understand that it's a better place to be, to be in your own home. Um, here at conference, we've got a full team. They're very keen to engage with, with people that have uh, clever ideas on how we can improve things. We'd like to think we can help enable some of those solutions. So please come visit us on the stand. And the final thing to say from my perspective is just to enjoy the conference. I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of people. Take care. Thank you, Andrew. Just reminding everybody that we do have the conference app. If there's any questions through the panel, please put them through the app and I'll pick them up on stage. And now we talked on stage about implementation. I really am excited for this panel debate and the speakers that are going to be coming on. So I want to welcome our three localities. Firstly, Ian McBeath, Strategic Director of Health and Wellbeing at Bradford, Metropolitan District Council. But Ian and I have worked online now for two and a half years and he was the key driver with our ADAS colleagues and Alison Toombs, if she's in the audience from North Tyneside, who led the work on the ADAS Commission. Ian's been absolutely fantastic with TSA, with our sector, in challenging us to find a way of making this happen. So over to you, Ian. Hi everyone. This is strange actually. I can sort of hear them and not you. But um, so I'm Ian McBeath. Um, I am Strategic Director of Health and Wellbeing for Bradford Council. You might have seen Bradford in the news recently. We are in the bidding to be City of Culture in 2025. And no council director may come to a stage without mentioning it and selling Bradford. Um, and so what I've done for you is a themed presentation for slides. Uh, we're celebrating the anniversary of Charles Dickens coming to St George's Hall uh, in Bradford to uh, recite some of his novels. So I've done you a Charles Dickens themed uh, presentation. Um, and so first slide, there are only four, is about the commission itself. So here we go. Um, the commission attempted to answer one question and that was why haven't anybody really, why haven't we really integrated care and technology properly? Why isn't it fully integrated? What are the barriers? What are the things that we can do to, uh, to, to push that forward? And as Alison said, I tried to be challenging con constructively. Um, I'd argue providers, care providers, have embraced technology where it's really in their benefit to do so. Think about home care and the rotors. Um, actually, think about home, uh, care homes uh, during the pandemic. Um, I think it's commissioners like me working in the local authority. I'm the director of adult social services. It's commissioners like me who not, haven't necessarily got the expertise in what technology has to offer so that when it comes around to us writing a tender for a care home contract or a home care contract, we can't build it in because we don't quite know what's available. But we can't ask one company because then we'd be favouring them and we end up in this sort of vicious commissioning cycle and that's what we've got to break um, as commissioners. And if you introduce GDPR and the ethics of it, it gets even worse. So that's the vicious cycle I'm determined uh, that we're going we're gonna to break. Um, and, and actually the pandemic can help us here because I think in the past we hid behind, well, are our punters really into technology? Are their expectations high? Well, they are now because they're into online banking, and online shopping and all the things that people who were um, having to, uh, to shield had to do. So um, that, that's my mission as a commissioner. Um, if I move to Bradford, 
So we've got a digital plan uh, in Bradford and it's terrific. And actually uh, three of my colleagues are in the audience uh, today. Um, we've got a brilliant in-house service in Bradford and we've actually just made it a wee bit bigger. We've actually brought in the response service. Paul Burstow talked about the response service um, earlier on so that when the tech does detect something, then we've got someone to answer that call and wrap a, wrap a service around them. So we can, we can really build on that. Um, for me, the biggest thing that councils have got to tackle is the culture. Um, it's, it's educating our social workers, our OTs, our staff into what the art of the possible is. They've got to sit in someone's home and while they're doing their care assessment or they're speaking to them on the phone, they've got to sell the idea of technology to them. They've got to make it sound like, you know, it's not um, uh, just doing it on the cheap. It's a great supplement. It's a, a wonderful way of uh, preserving your independence. And so we need to um, educate them in what tech can do. And that means involving them in the evaluation and selling all the stories. And we've seen Pam's story, I mean, I could reel off half a dozen. Actually, families feel much more confident when their loved ones are protected by technology too. So we've got to educate our workforce to make sure uh, they can sell uh, those ideas to people when they're, when they're in their homes. And, and Bradford's got a fairly unique opportunity in that we happen to have, we're only one of three councils in the country that have an IT system called System One. And that's the one that most GP surgeries have and most community health services have. Social care in Bradford has System 1. So we've got a unique opportunity to join up those databases and really use that intelligence uh, that we've got to, to assist people. So let's turn to the, uh, to the, the white paper and the government. Um, so we've seen the adult care reform uh, paper that was on the stage earlier on, and it talks about accelerating the adoption of technology. Uh, that's great, I'm, I'm really behind that. I'm a little bit fearful that we've already popped ourselves in the box of uh, falls and shared care records, but actually there's a huge spectrum of tech that we could be investing in. So I'm hoping we'll be able to convince the government and perhaps some of my council partners to go further uh, in their investment in technology. Um, I, I also want to hold on to the quote, and interestingly, it was the same quote uh, that Paul Burstow put in the magnifying glass on his presentation, which is the one about putting practical digital tools in the homes and hands of those drawing on care and support and their carers, uh, and, and, that, and all that knowledge that we can use to help people. Um, that's the one that I honed in on too, and I think is the, is the most important one, and that's linking care, tech, housing, all the things that people need um, to be independent. So my last slide um, is just looking to the future, really. Um, so every council's got difficult financial troubles at the moment, but we mustn't perturb, uh, let that perturb us. We've got to push forward. Um, they're literally, if we keep the same model we've got now, today, there literally aren't enough care workers, even in five years' time, to, to keep the model that we've got now. We've got to do something different, and technology has got to be right at the heart of that. Every council in the next five years will be tendering their home care contracts. Without fail, they'll all be doing it. So the question is, why, when and how will they be including appendices and schedules in their home care contracts that include a demand for tech? And how will they do that? And how will they get that knowledge uh, in order to write that tender? How will they co-produce that both with people and their families and the tech sector and their care providers? That's what you've got to do. You've got to combine all those people together, say, what's the art the possible? What's the future of care at home? Um, and, and really sell it to people. I saw a great thing on Twitter yesterday. It was a, a woman advertising uh, for a particular shift of care worker, 24-hour um, uh, shifts, because she wanted a spontaneous life rather than a calendar-driven, you know, timetabled life. She wanted something spontaneous and she really gave me a lot of thought about it. I can't believe that tech hasn't got a big part to play in the spontaneous life and in people's well-being in the future. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Ian, if you just take a seat in case there's questions. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going on to hear from our colleagues from Surrey. Do you both want to take the issue? So Tony Carney, Head of Resource and Another Social Care, and also Claire White, Lead Practitioner and Improvement and Development Manager. Well, we've set the scene for your presentation. Over to both of you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is it afternoon yet? Yeah, just about. Um, as you said, uh, Alison, if you saw the film of Pam in the plenary session, this is a bit of the story of how we got there. Um, so I have to be honest, at Surrey County Council, um, we've struggled for many years to develop 
a consistent and uh, comprehensive tech offer for both the residents of Surrey uh, and those that, the people that are supported by adult social care. We knew that tech would enable better outcomes for people, uh, but the landscape in Surrey is complicated. We have 11 district and borough councils providing a traditional telecare offer. We have adult social care providing a county-wide uh, adult social care offer and five acute hospitals across the county working very differently. We commissioned a piece of independent user research in 2020 and uh, the purpose of that was to give us some traction around the use of tech and they came up with nine recommendations. But the overarching recommendation was to start small with one or two partners to test things out and to learn by doing. So in January 2021, together with our partner, Mall Valley District Council, we worked hard to, to develop a one team approach undertaking trusted assessments with the aim of providing technology and services that would support people to remain independent in their own homes and connected to their communities. What's the challenge? The challenge in Surrey is much like anywhere else. A huge demand on our health and social care services and the demand for, uh, particularly for adult social care will increase under the charging reforms next year. We have an aging population and our home-based care providers struggle to recruit care workers. The promotion of independence to support res resilience is key. The vision uh, for uh, Surrey is Surrey Connected Care and for the last 15 months, with our partners, Moore Valley District Council, we have been working towards this vision of a proactive and preventative model using data-led interventions in our decision-making. With our IoT platform provider, Cascade 3D, we have seen the benefits of discrete monitoring to support people to live independently at home. The ambition is to make this service available county-wide for people with eligible social care needs, as well as self-funders. My colleague, Claire, will tell you a little bit more about the service. Thank you. Thank you for having us, everybody. And our colleagues from Mole Valley Life are in the audience, so this is for you guys as well. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the service, what the service actually is, so a bit more detail. So the service is a collaborative piece of work as a partnership working using technology enabled care to try and deliver personalised outcomes and that's the really important bit. Um, in Surrey we've been working on strength based practice which is all about creating resilience and independence in the people that we work with. Um, so what does the service look like? We've got um, an expedient hospital discharge process. So we've got um, what we call a grab pack that can be issued to people as they leave hospital and it's a portable, um, uh, portable key safe and a digital alarm so that people can go home a little bit more quickly. We've also got the trusted assessment model. So what that means is our colleagues in Mole Valley Life provide the trusted assessor and our staff in adult social care do the assessment with people they're working with and they identify the outcomes that they want to achieve which the trusted assessor will then look at what's the technological solution that might achieve that. We're using connected care ADL monitoring so what that is is sensors that monitor movement and temperature around the home and also smart plugs that monitor use of devices like kettles and microwaves um, and we're also we're linked up to the 24-7 emergency response service which is our alarm receiving centre. So that's our regular telecare centre. So they can actually pick up data insights um, because they're there 24-7. Um, we're doing regular proactive wellbeing calls and we heard earlier about the difference that makes. So Sue, we're very proud about Sue. Um, uh, sorry, about Pam and um, obviously you heard from her friend Sue. but. Um, I think the difference that the proactive calls made to her were quite significant and more significant than you would have thought. And actually the ability to draw herself out of, out of her current situation was probably bigger than just the use of the technology. 
Um, we've, we've developed a wellbeing a responder service that only actually went live in March this year. Um, and what that allows us to do is respond immediately if something happens, if we're not perhaps going to use an ambulance call out or even if we're going to use an ambulance at the same time. But the responders are really well trained in first aid. They're able to get people up off the floor. They're able to notice things in people's environment, notice if the house is cold, notice if there's um, you know, an awful lot of clutter, notice any risks and respond to that. Um, and then we're also, all of us in the project team are connecting people to their communities. So we've tried to train all of our staff in social care, all of the staff involved at Mole Valley Life to just be very knowledgeable about what's around and about for people and try and connect them back to things that matter. It's very strange being up here with all that noise, isn't it? So what are the benefits that we found from using technology? So. For the assessment process, now if I'm talking about our staff, what it actually does is it enables us to um, write, uh, sort of look at people's package of care. It, it evidences and monitors their actual movements around the house. So it's kind of real time what's going on in somebody's house. And the point being that too much care can disable people. So we want to make sure that we get the right level of support at the right time. And you heard that in the plenary session. So what we've been able to do is have an evidence base to the decisions about how much care and support people need. And we've been able to intervene at the right time to either reduce or increase people's care as is needed. Um, the second thing that we have is we have the ability to use the actionable, we call them actionable insights. What the data tells us is not the full story, but it tells us something. It gives us reason to think that there's something that needs our attention. So the sort of example I can give you is people who have got urinary tract infections might be going to the toilet a little bit more frequently. We notice that and we can decide how we're going to respond to that. And that might just be a phone call to them. It might be a phone call to their relative. We've had a couple of cases where we've been able to get the district nurse in early and then she's been able to prescribe antibiotics and we've avoided a hospital admission. And we've also had examples of people who theoretically are cooking for themselves and leading an independent life, but we can see that they're not using the kitchen, they're not using appliances in the kitchen. And so we've been able to intervene again proactively and right size their support in the other direction and put more support in in a situation like that. Um, the reassurance can't be underestimated. It's a curious one when you're thinking about the money. But actually, the reassurance for people and the well-being impact that um, a service user themselves can feel more reassured, as you saw with Pam and her video, but actually that her relatives and people around them can feel reassured. And I think it's that, you know, unquantifiable thing, but actually is hugely important to people. Um, I never want to say anything too rude about health partners, having been a health colleague myself, but um, the, the rut in deer at the end is about differences of opinion between health professionals. We all see it. We find that consultants, I hope there's no consultants in the audience, often say things like, you need to go into a nursing home, you need to go into residential care. The OTs say, no, we're fighting for independence. And this gives you the opportunity to have some real data to look at and see what is the true picture here put the person at the centre and work out with them what it is that they need and want. What else has it enabled us to do? We started this service in our reablement service. So we particularly looked at setting goals for people, so goals towards independence. So an example would be somebody who's come out of hospital, they were previously independent, and actually now they're not able to cook, but they want to be able to cook again. So what we can do is by plotting their increased movement in the kitchen, we can actually see that they're doing more. But more importantly, they can then chart their own progress. They can see that they've improved. They can sort of mindfully be aware of that. And I think you saw that in Pam's video. It was about how she began to feel more confident by small things, not necessarily the big things. The rather sinister feat, I'm afraid, was my attempt to give you a visual about um, safety and risk. So we have lots of purposeful walkers. We have people, residents who wander at night, go out the front door. We have people who are in hospital and the ward are very concerned about perhaps their toileting behaviours. So we had a really great example of a man who was on the ward and he was going to the loo about 12 times a night and everybody was worried. So we put 24, 24 hour care in when he went home but we also put the connected care in at the same time. And what we were very soon able to see was, yes, he was going to the toilet, 
many times, but he was doing it safely. So we needn't have been so concerned. We reduced his care. He was happy. It gave him a more um, authentic life with a bit more choice for himself. I think, I mean, you all know, I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted about the cost of bed days in hospital, probably about £450 a day on average. If we can stop people going into hospital, it's better for them. It means they don't catch bugs. It means they don't get stuck in the system. It means all sorts of things. But it also means for the whole social care and health economy, it saves us all money. So it's, it's better. It's better for everybody. And if we can get people out of hospital more quickly, which we can by putting the technology in, it creates that extra layer of reassurance. And everybody is a bit more uh, mindful about taking positive risks rather than necessarily being risk Averse. Um, and the final one is about um, stopping people going into residential care or delaying their journey into residential care. And I can tell you a lovely story of a gentleman who was in his 70s and his mum was in hospital and she was in her 90s. She came out of hospital and everybody said it's residential care for you. And, you know, he didn't want that. She didn't want that. But also he had health issues of his own. He'd had a stroke, actually. So what we did was we put the connected care kit in. It wasn't plain sailing because he actually had to learn to use the um, dashboard so that he could actually be confident that he could see by not being in the house his mum was getting about all right but actually what he did first of all was moved in with her leaving his wife at home which was a bit sad but that was because he was so concerned about his mum so the kit went in we actually taught him how to use the dashboard with support support from the voluntary sector and he was able to go home and be reassured which was fantastic and his mum stayed at home for another eight months and if you think about for her that was by far and away the better outcome for his health it was better. He was a high risk of a future stroke, having had a stroke. So it was a kind of win-win situation. So if we can avoid those care costs, residential care costs about, in Surrey, an average is about £760 a week. If we can avoid that, then it's all to the good. And my final slide, which I'm going to whip through really quickly, but um, I'm sure you'll have some questions, is, you know, obstacles and barriers. Do you like my bill that is the obstacle, the unmoving obstacle? So upskilling the workforce has been tricky during times of COVID. Um, colleagues mentioned that social care staff worry that this is all about saving money and not about good outcomes for people. But what's actually happened is as we've had success with this pilot and we've had some good news stories, social care workers have begun to feel a lot more confident and actually everybody is much more on board. It's a journey because we've got a lot of social care staff in Surrey. I think about one and a half thousand. Um, so staff engagement, staff have been a little bit worried about people's privacy and ethics as have some service users and residents. So again, we've had to work through that, the, the elements of being monitored, but there are no cameras and there are no auditory recordings. Um, consent has baffled us because we started out only using the technology with people who were able to consent to it, but we quickly found that it had huge benefits for people who couldn't consent. So we've had to develop good processes, good guidance for our staff about how you might make a best interest assessment, a decision to put technology in. We've worked with um, the provider to improve the dashboard and make it much more easy for family members to utilise. And we've put champions into the locality teams that we're working with to really upskill staff and take the whole process forward. So back to Tony for the last slide. Thank you. Um, I think Claire's already mentioned that we launched the Wellbeing and Responder Service on the 1st of March. Um, really early days for that service, but the benefits are evident. Um, quicker responses to individuals, to residents who need our help. Uh, and benefits to our ambulance service as well in terms of unnecessary, reducing unnecessary call outs. Um, we plan to launch the service to sell funders in the next few months and then we hope to roll it out, uh, this model out across um, the, the county. We think we've got a really good blueprint and um, I'm hoping to talk actually to the Department of Health and Social Care about how they could use this blue, blue, blueprint in other places. Uh, and finally, we want our workforce in adult social care to be thinking tech first. Um, we, we really do believe it's the way forward. Uh, thank you for listening to us. Um, our contact details are on the next slide. 
we're here for two, the whole two days and do um, approach Claire and I and we'll be happy to tell you more. Uh, even better, if you can help us, then we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take a seat on there. Thank you so much. That's really insightful. Many of you will have seen over the two year period in COVID that we've led some discussions around our colleagues in Carmarthenshire. Um, it's per personally inspired me about how in the get go in Carmarthenshire, you get that foundations to truly deliver that bespoke care. I'm delighted that we have our colleagues, Jake Morgan and Hugh Thomas from Health, going to be talking about how you actually got community connected care right for health and social care. Over to you, you. Welcome everybody in this strange scenario with you all with headphones. It is it's probably fitting with a, um, a digital conference. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Delta Connect, which is a project for us. We deliver it through an arm's length company um, of the local authority, which we have found gives us both the benefits perhaps of being a bit more agile, but also the, there we go, pick up where I left off, but it also, is that better? I'm looking, it's like a bond of fellow presenters when you don't know what's going on. You've got people kind of there to save you when you make mistakes like that. Um, so I'm, we'll, we'll talk a bit about uh, the project as a whole and how, for me, as a director in a local authority, it's underpinning and it's our, our first door preventative offer um, through which every service user will go. So um, we face, um, we're working in a Welsh context, which is really different. Um, devolution has changed things dramatically for us over the last 20 years, and our policy context is completely different. Um, we have, of course, the common challenges, of demographic change, growing numbers of older people, um, frailty and the complexity of delivering services in frailty, and of course, the challenges of retaining and uh, recruiting a workforce to deliver the quality of care we want. Overt in our policy framework is the rebalancing of the sector. So from where I stand from, I see quite a broken model of commissioning, um, a model of care where um, we have the indignity of treating care, in, in many cases, care deliveries um, like an Amazon delivery, where we'll give people segments of time, where we pay people minimum wage. And to some extent, I've been part of creating that world, while in Wales, that we definitely see a bigger role for the public sector. And I think in um, creating national standards in a national care service similar to Scotland, um, where we do have a real living wage for every care worker across Wales and where we produce dignity in the work and go on that journey to retaining that skilled workforce. We had a Social Services and Wellbeing Act in 2014, which embedded a lot of the things we're hearing about um, in the white paper, personalization of care, a duty of prevention. So it's a statutory duty for us to offer preventative services um, and a partnership approach really facilitated by funding from national government around regional partnerships where local government and health come together. So 2015-16, we had a care line service that hadn't evolved really since the 1990s. Um, it was based on um, something bad happens to you and you can let somebody know. And it simply hadn't evolved since then. It was loss making. We provided to quite a large number of organizations, um, but um, for the local authority, it ran at quite a significant loss. Um, and we had going in parallel with that, a budget that was increasing above inflation by five to 10% every year, sending the graphs of doom finance directors always saw where the council would run nothing but social care within 10 years if we didn't do something different. Um, so we looked around at the time about who was doing it. And you can see there, there's a 2015 Guardian article um, there um, in relation to um, Barcelona. We're very lucky, one of our partners with Tunstall, we went out to Barcelona. Um, 
We had a tour of what they were delivering there and we took it away and we were really fortunate in being able to then go on our own journey around uh, responsive tech and what it means for the service user. So I'm not going to talk to you anything about technology. It's all about the service we provide and the workforce we deliver. Um, what By going out jointly with Health and Hugh and his colleagues to Barcelona, it gave us a vision and it gave us an offer that we could sell to what we in Wales had a transformation fund, I'm sure in England, Scotland, they have similar funds. Um, and we got a significant allocation for us in a relatively small bit, underpopulated bit of West Wales of seven and a half million um, to design an exemplar program of technology and care delivering it. And that uh, really was based in many ways on the evidence we got in Barcelona, but was also on a, on a bit of a bet. It was a bit of a trust me. Um, this is intuitive. It should work. But you know what? The politicians who are given the green light at the minute probably aren't going to see the financial benefit within their cycle. And it's a, it's a hard pitch to deliver because I think we're only seeing the benefits now in terms of our bottom line um, three, four, five years into the investment. Um, so the service we provided, um, five steps to connect, digital support and tech packages. You get a whole menu of offers. Um, I'm not going to go into there. Some of you guys know way more about that than me. What I have learned is it changes every six months and there are more things on offer and there are more things available. Um, digital support, <coughs> uh, key worker support guidance. Um, so the, the model is based on the premise of a well-being assessment. Um, it's a universal services. Half the people on, in the program um, are not known to social care. They, they're not known particularly to health services. Some pay privately for it. Um, others have it as part of an early intervention assessment. They get proactive call monitoring, a call on their birthday through to um, um, regular well-being. And that's, that's created through an algorithm from the original assessment, which, which creates um, a certain levels of proactive care and responsiveness. And we have a 24-7 um, community welfare response, which will get to you in 45 minutes. So whatever happens to you, someone will not just be on the phone, someone will get to you in 45 minutes. And you can imagine in that scenario throughout the COVID crisis, what a gain that was for us. Um, we think it's the only, certainly the only service of its kind in Wales. It, it, it's registered. It's enabled us to evolve to emergency bridging when someone needs to get out of hospital during COVID, um, a holistic wraparound, a monitoring, a safety net really, which is you can go home, you well are well enough to go home. Um, in the middle of COVID, it was emergency support. When a residential home collapsed, we had our emergency response team going in there, propping up and making that service work. Um, it really was the third arm of um, you, if you got health, social care, we had Delta Wellbeing, and that was our third or third arm as as we went through the the pandemic. So, um, in terms of outputs, it's firmly embedded. Um, four and a half thousand people in West Wales receive this service. Um, um, there's a really clear prevent here. We don't want people as a last resort, as a last preventative um, element that we're going in uh, to prevent someone going into residential care. This is um, close to a universal service for many people. As an indicator, it will cost someone six pounds a week to receive that service. Um, we've made over 42,000 proactive calls. Um, uh, we've responded to hundreds of falls um, and make regular welfare calls, um, which has undoubtedly turned into some pretty decent outcomes for us. So um, people have the confidence that someone will be there. We all know we've had scenarios over the last year or two where people have waited two, three, four, five hours for ambulances. Um, someone will be there, they're false trained uh, and and 
they're, they're able to access other services beyond beyond going to hospital. So our, our core people um, are trained to solve the problem, um, not just to pass it on. Um, we can quantify our, our reduced ambulance calls. Um, we know exactly, we ran a care line service before, we know what we would have blue lighted before, um, and we can quantify those. And you know, you can see a certain amount of maths, but actually the, the value is much greater because the value is I didn't have someone going into hospital, um, I didn't have someone deconditioned in hospital, and then having a disruption to their care package, which results in uh, a hugely painful intervention to restate it. Um, and I think for me, most importantly, um, clients have um, absolutely self-assessed on a well-being score, independently evaluated how much better they feel. Now, my bet is, and you can never evidence what would have happened if we didn't have it, but my bet is if people feel well, they feel better and they feel more independent, then I'm absolutely certain they will be better and they will be more independent. And um, that's been one of the most powerful. Um, final word, and I'm gonna play a very short video. Um, the workforce is at the core of our service. We have 150 people working for Delta Wellbeing. It's a big, it's a big service. Um, it's a big service delivering over a wide geographical area. Um, it delivers to 30 different organizations in different ways. Some people contract with us and we have our core service um, built locally in West Wales. But our workforce, um, when we created an arm's length company, we didn't change terms and conditions. It wasn't a cost saving exercise. It was simply a method to be a bit more agile whilst retaining some of those benefits of sick pay, um, a good hourly rate, which keeps people in the service. So I'm gonna play a short video now which will tell you a little bit from the people who receive the service, um, how they experience it. Here's how the Connect service has been supporting some of our clients. 82 year old Rex had recently returned home after a long spell in hospital. His son would normally visit him daily to support him in his everyday life, but he was shielding during lockdown so visits were not as easy. His mood was extremely low and he lost weight following hospital, which left him frail and vulnerable. Oh, hello. Hi, it's Sean again from Delta Wellbeing. So how, is, how yeah. has it helped you having the phone calls every week? All the people that have phoned me have been really nice, you know. They've made me feel at home. Longest time of the week was the weekend, waiting for Louise to phone me on a Monday morning. <laughs> With you only having the one call a week on the Monday, it might be, you know, we could look at you maybe having two calls a week instead of the one. Oh, it did make the world to me. Donna was a survivor of domestic abuse and had suicidal tendencies and depression. She was one of 8,500 people shielding in Carmarthenshire and was self-isolating due to multiple long-term conditions. Oh, hi, it's Louise from the Delta Wellbeing team. How are you? How has your week been? Oh, it's been good, thank you. I've had another few dinners this week. Oh, have you? How are you managing in the lockdown? Have you been using your tablet? Yes, yes, I'm okay and I've been using it lots this week. Oh, brilliant. What have you been using it for? Well, I've been catching up with my daughter in England. She recently moved house and she gave me a virtual tour so I can see all the rooms of the house. <laughs> Amazing. No, I'd love to see her currently. No, no. Oh, that's really good. Good. And how are you for shopping? Oh, I'm doing good at the moment. I'm still having the food parcels delivered to me, which is a really great help. Excellent. Good to hear. Well, if you need anything, you know where I am. It's been lovely talking to you, and I'll give you a call next week. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Louise. You're Bye. welcome. Bye. Hi, my name is Gareth, and I support people on the Connect programme with digital help. Digital inclusion was always a big part of the project, but this has become even more important in our response to the COVID pandemic. When the community wellbeing officer works with someone, they give them a digital prescription which tailors apps and online content to help individual wellbeing goals. This can range from self-management apps to links to an online church. For some of our clients who may be digitally anxious, we have worked with a local company to design an adaptive tablet that is not only easy to use, but has some locked elements to ensure the user's safety. 
We obviously work closely with the third sector on this to provide much needed digital help. We have also created a unique platform called connect to you which is a virtual social network. It's our way of creating virtual communities of interest. We are even using this technology to create a virtual day centre to replace our physical day centres that have been closed due to COVID. I do a karaoke um, every day with Tracy and I talk to the boys in Cossans. And I like doing everything on there, I like joining in with people I do. And I do exercises twice a day on there. I go in the living room, I put the iPad on, and then I just move like this and I move my arm like that and then I just copy what other people do on it then. Yeah, and I enjoy it. Yeah. Good exercises for you. Connect have been wonderful. They came in and they set up the Wi-Fi for me. They gave me the tablet. They showed me how to use it. And if I have any problems, all I have to do, press a button and I'm connected to them immediately and they help me. The best thing about this technology is that it allows me to live independently in my own home. And that's the best part. We are focusing on ways in which we can proactively support people to help themselves when developing our falls prevention services. Sport and Leisure have developed a 32-week proactive falls prevention program in partnership with Health and Social Care. Clients are assessed via the Connect project and Delta Wellbeing and referred to the Proactive Force Prevention Programme. The proactive approach provides clients with three exercise opportunities each week, educational sessions covering key topics such as nutrition, home safety, podiatry needs and ongoing support throughout their journey. During COVID-19, Sport and Leisure has enhanced its service by offering live stream and on-demand exercise opportunities to our new digital platform, Active Anywhere. The Proactive Falls Prevention Programme will be delivered digitally through Active Anywhere, where clients are referred from the Connect project accessing the content through their tablet and they will be supported by their wellbeing officer. I enjoy it, you know, I mean, I look forward to it actually, you know, and seeing everybody else as well. I think it's great. Before my grandmother had the lifeline, if we were to call her and she didn't answer the phone, it's a long way for us to drive an hour just to check on her to see if she's okay. That is not sustainable long term, especially when we've got young children or we've got work commitments, but we had to go down to, to check on her. So now that my grandmother has a lifeline, it's 24 seven, we can go to bed in the evening and not have to worry that uh, we would be woken to a call. But not only that, as a family, it's so reassuring. It benefits us just as much as it benefits my grandmother. And she says to me all of the time, I couldn't be without it now. In so many ways, my independence has been taken away from me, which has made me completely housebound. And therefore, my button is all I've got with the, with the outside world, really. Well, my, my pendant is very important to me because it, it is my lifeline. It gives me confidence. And um, I know that when I'm in trouble, and I have been in trouble on a number of occasions from falling, that uh, I've only got to press it and the response is immediately. Okay, um, an, an important part of this project has been, it's been a partnership with health and has been health, my health colleagues buying into a model of um, uh, the, the need to address the social causes of health inequalities. And, you know, I'm really grateful Hugh's come along, um, Director of Finance uh, for the Health Board, um, to tell you kind of our next stage on our journey. <clears throat> well, Josh Jacobs, uh, I was half thinking of doing a uh, Will Smith, Chris Rock kind of handover there, but uh, maybe not the best advert for uh, integration. Um, Josh, my my arbenical board ma, I'm uh, brave young called board ma heavy or Kevin Cymru. It's uh, great to be here from uh, West Wales today to tell you a little bit 
uh, about our story. And um, I guess by introducing it in Welsh there, I just want to emphasise that a really key part of this is culture and the cultural, local cultural sensitivity of delivering a service is, is really uh, important uh, for us. I never got to go to Barcelona, actually. Uh, I didn't get that opportunity, but I get Birmingham instead. So, you know, clearly, clearly doing better for it. Um, there is a huge amount that uh, I think we can collectively do by working across health and social care. Um, I'm Director of Finance for the Health Board and we're an integrated organisation as it stands in, in health terms and inherently a population health uh, organisation. And that means that it's fundamental for us to be working with colleagues from social care, to be thinking about what are those determinants of health, what are those things that are, are driving health demand uh, for us. And I think that's a, that, that's a bit of a hallmark of the way in which we've been um, engaging across our system uh, over the last few years. I think as a population health system, integration is kind of embedded, it's hardwired into our DNA. It really is part of the way in which we work. But integration with partners outside health does bring its challenges. And those challenges, I think, are are clearly things that need to be unlocked, understood from the outset. We've got a great policy framework in Wales, and I'm really proud of that um, policy framework. But there is still need a need to align values across organisations as we think about um, uh, working together. And importantly, you know, there are two probably big elements of variation between health and social care. In social care choice is really important. That choice for people to live their lives um, with, with freedom, with dignity uh, and independently. Um, and choice isn't something that's necessarily bred into the way in which we work in health. Actually, it tends to be doctor knows best. Um, and choice in Wales in the NHS is not, um, not even where um, some of the options are in England with being able to choose necessarily your provider of choice. So choice, I think, is a big area of variation. And the other one, of course, is that health is free at the point of use, uh, whatever the circumstances. Uh, and that is, is another point of, of difference, I think. But getting those values aligned at the start of an integration journey is really important. With um, the setup that we've got with Delta, it gives us a fantastic opportunity to think about how we use um, where do I go on to? Integrated working. There we go. Um, how we use the infrastructure, the asset that we have within Delta to think about um, chronic conditions more broadly and what we can do to think about our management of chronic conditions more effectively. We've, we've picked on um, three areas of particular focus for us at this point in time. Heart failure, and we've got an arrangement in place with, with Delta to monitor some of our heart failure patients, COPD, and arm technology, which is, is giving us some insight into um, people with frailty, people who are frail, and how do we, uh, understanding how we support them better. And we've also, uh, Jake mentioned the third arm. The third arm has been a fundamental part of our response to COVID and integrated into our hospital setting. So we've got our community wellbeing offices based in our emergency departments and wards uh, and working as part of an MDT across uh, health and social care and really providing that kind of proactive response to take patients from hospital into a, into a, a safe community uh, framework and setting. Really important. Some projects we, we're looking at at the moment, um, Frailty, where we, we've just embarked on a programme of um, using robotic process automation, artificial intelligence to bring together what is a perennial challenge across health and a perennial challenge certainly with integration of disparate data sources, disparate systems, bringing that information together and using that to drive an understanding of where our risk is so that we can better, more proactively allocate our resources and, and our workforce to uh, address those challenges. 
And we're also really exploring what do we mean by virtual hospitals. We hear much in terms of lofty ambitions here, but what we've not actually got are um, robust models of delivery for um, virtual hospitals. And that's a real challenge for us. And I think a real challenge for industry. And if I could reach out to industry partners here today, to say I think this is going to be a developing theme and framework for us that's really important to, to understand. Within health, the technology sector in health, focus on very sector specific issues, generally in hospital, generally in a, care, in, in a health setting. We, we are moving and seeing examples of piecemeal development into, into homes, but it's piecemeal. It's not, um, it's not wholesale. And with care technology, that doesn't always lend itself to give the same confidence that some of our secondary care clinicians need and our primary care colleagues to discharge people or provide a prescribed solution uh, around them to support them. Uh, and of course, consumer technology, while that's moving very rapidly, it doesn't have the same regulatory framework around it. And that's a real um, issue for us. So in terms of Connect, um, the evaluation um, of Connect has shown that it's uh, uh, provided demonstrably improved outcomes to our clients, our patients, our, our people. It certainly supported earlier discharge, up to five days earlier discharge than would otherwise have been happening in, in a system that is as challenged as, as we have at this, this point in time. And that's been a real, real boon to us. Um, it has given our hospital staff growing confidence to discharge earlier. And that confidence over time will grow further. And that's a developing journey for us. And of course, reduce some of the pressures, as Jake mentioned, in social care and in uh, and community uh, teams. And importantly, it has started to address some of those areas of unmet need and unmet demand that we have got in our system before it becomes to a it becomes a crisis point. Um, what next? There's a real. Um, if I just reflect very briefly on some analysis recently that offer it um, um, fairly often from the Commonwealth Fund, which compares performance of health systems across the world. The NHS in the UK does reasonably well on most measures, except for one, which is outcomes. We are not doing well in the NHS in the UK generally on outcomes compared with our peers. I think that this model we are developing here with Delta, with uh, colleagues in Carmarthenshire, really does start to address that outcome conundrum for us and helps us um, with a system that really puts patient outcomes at the front. We have got some challenges clearly in terms of demographic growth, I don't need to repeat those, but also um, the workforce just isn't there. We, we are talking now about an economy that um, cannot sustain the level of workforce that health and care may need. Technology has got to play a key part in our response to this, to develop and deliver productivity, not so much from a finance perspective, and I say that as a finance director, but actually from a necessity perspective. There just aren't the people out there. So we're gonna to have to use technology to help our workforce, our precious resource in workforce, to work in the most efficient, effective uh, way. And that's really the challenge I think we're gonna have to start to um, understand, connect with over the next um, few years. And in so doing, I think the integration between us, between us and Carmarthenshire, and between um, us and Delta becomes ever more important uh, in that response. So we are certainly looking to expand the Connect service. We're working with partners to look at how the service itself can be further enhanced using artificial intelligence and using the pulling together of disparate data sources to understand the person and understand how we wrap the right support around that person. And then look at how we really exploit this infrastructure to best effect uh, across um, our whole system.
Um, with that, Chair, I think I am pretty much over. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a few questions, but I just want some reflections. Um, how amazing is it to see a finance director of a health board trust talking so passionately with his colleague who leads a local authority about how embedded our tech service is in Carmarthenshire. I think we all need to look on that. How do we deliver our vision for putting people at the heart of care in that strategy? It's the strong implementation that Ian and I have been championed for in that white paper. We will look over that border, you know, in fondness of what you've actually achieved. If I go back to Newcastle 10 years ago, when I looked at flexible service models and pleaded my local authority and my CCG, I got a closed door. But I kept going back. But here we are nationally where it's actually happening. We need to learn. On this stage over the next few days, you're going to hear lots of stuff about responder services. We've seen the great responder services in Carmarthenshire, in Surrey, and we, we're seeing how NHS want to work with us. So this afternoon, join us with our colleagues in NHS Improvement to talk about how we take that forward. You're going to hear about housing tomorrow because that plays a massive role. Housing was the catalyst in, in Carmarthenshire of that Delta service. And look at where it is now. Many of your services were bypassed in COVID by your local authority going to call centres. In Carmarthenshire, they were on the top table in the top team and they were the response that led to this coordinated response, uh, approach. We can do this in all of those regions, Surrey, wherever we want to do it, but we've got to bring the data, the people and the partnerships together. So I have one question for every one of the panel. What is your top thing you would like the audience to take away and learn over the next two days? Because we have a lot to learn, but we can all deliver what you see on this stage today. So over to Ian. I think mine's going to be the culture. Um, oh, mine's going to be about the culture. So it's um, convincing our staff to be promoting technology more, work out what the linkages are to what we've already got and um, how it can help. <clears throat> but also as commissioners, we've got a little bit of work to do. And if I was going to point out a deficit um, in, in council commissioning, it's where data rich but intelligence can poor. Um, so so building you. on the so building on that intelligence that we could have um, and proving the business case and what works. working it's about health social care and um, the private sector districts and boroughs we all need to pull together because it is the wraparound service it's not one thing that is going to achieve these outcomes for our residents um, I, I agree with Claire and I also agree with Ian the culture is really key and uh, you have to take your workforce with you um, this is not something that you can do to them you have to carry them uh, along so the culture in the, in, in the place is uh, key for me thank you I guess what workforce underpins everything for me we've had social care on the cheap for too long uh, paying people minimum wage with the commissioning models we've got isn't sustainable. We will one way or another have to pay more for care and we'll have to pay carers more. Um, and those terms and conditions in terms of the services we're delivering, um, a real living wage for all our care staff, whether you commission it or you provide it ourselves, is a prerequisite to the Delta services and every service we provide because without that, um, you will never build that quality workforce that you need to, su to support the technology. Yeah, thank you. Uh, take this off, I don't want to hear myself twice. Uh, I think uh, from my perspective, it would be values. Um, and I've heard some talk about this, the approach that we've taken from a cost effectiveness basis. Um, and I do worry when we think about this as being an opportunity to take cost out 
this has got to be an opportunity to provide better outcomes for our residents and really focus on um, not something on the cheap, but something that delivers for the person that we're all trying to care for. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, lunch is served. Have a great afternoon and see us back at two o'clock on the innovation stage. Thank you.